lot of abstract, um, a lot of abstract um, photographs, a lot of compositing. Okay. Um, I'm now seeing that meeting is being recorded. I might have to. Uh, I think you should just, if you hit continue, it should go off your screen. Thank you. Thank you. I lost my, my mouse is gone for some reason, but enter helped. Thanks, Betsy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Harry Callahan, um, also these beautiful, he worked a lot with composites with film. Uh-oh, now my, uh, now my um, keynote isn't working. My, uh, I have no mouse. Oh, I guess that worked. Okay, we'll see if that works. Um, here's another photographer uh, from, uh, I want to say this guy is from the 50s and 60s, from uh, one of the German movements, I believe. Um, but his work, again, again, these degrees of abstraction. So I also wanted to kind of emphasize that that's one of the joys of abstract photography is it can be done through a lot of experimentation and, and accidental surprises, right? Um, you know, I think as photographers, most of us are type A personalities. And one of the things with photography that why we do photography is because we want full control of our medium, of our tools, of everything we do, which is that it makes us, um, you know, we strive for that, right? Is to have control of our medium. Um, but with abstract photography, we can kind of sit back and play a little bit. And so I thought it'd be interesting to show examples of, of either accidents or pure experimentation throughout photo history that became abstract photographs. So, you know, if we talk about intention, it doesn't always have to be, I am setting out to make an abstract photograph. Uh, I mean, that's a fun way to approach it. And I would recommend that everybody tries that for sure. But there can also be abstract photographs that come out of pure experimentation. And these are, um, you know, early examples of photographs. Photography was announced in 1839. So this is a daguerreotype by Draper, right? A daguerreotype of the moon. You would never know that that's a, the, a daguerreotype of the moon, right? It looks like a kind of cool abstract photograph. And also, you know, William Henry Fox Talbot, these are very early photographers. This three sheets of gals, gals, I'm sure he's, he was probably just playing with transparency and, and testing his materials, not necessarily setting out to make an abstract photograph. Um, I'm okay. I'm going to keep going. I just, I, I kind of wanted to pop into my keynote and make sure this is going in order, but I've lost now mouse. I've lost control of keyboard ever since that thing came up. Um, and I can't even here. Let me let me just try something to make sure that this is going in order. Okay, it is. All right. Okay. Um, also, these are some of the early motion studies, the scientific photography, where these people were using the camera for scientific study, not to make art, um, but in the process, they've made these wonderful abstract images. Uh, you know, via their intention, which was to, to use the camera in scientific studies. And you probably know the great Harold Edgerton and his studies of motion, uh, human physiology, kinesiology, I should say more than kinesiology. Bernice Abbott, who uh, started out as a street photographer, really, um, photographing the streets of New York. Um, and then she later in her career was making scientific images for science textbooks. And again, the intention was to depict, uh, you know, for instance, this is sound waves or she was depicting, you know, the, the movement of light through prisms. So it was very controlled and very scientific, but to the, out, to the bystander coming up and looking at these and not knowing what they are, they're also beautiful abstract images. We're gonna look at some of these photographers when we dip into the little cliff note history too. Otto Steinart was a German photographer from um, a, a movement called Photoform. And luminogram, that was basically, it's light painting, right? It's um, before light painting existed or we had a name for it. So long exposures and painting with light. 
uh, Laszlo Mahali Nagy doing the same thing here, painting with light. And one thing, there, he, there were so many innovative things about what Mahali Nagy was doing um, with photography. And I've said this, if you've listened to any of my history courses, the people who were the most creative with photography in the history of photography were the people who came to it and were not trained photographers. They were trained uh, you know, graphic designers, painters, illustrators, architects. And they just picked up the camera and began to use it. And it was because they had no rules for what they were supposed to do with the camera, right? So uh, Mahali Najib was just playing with light and seeing what happened with it. Marco, Marco Brewer is a contemporary photographer who works with cameraless images. So um, photograms, basically. And I believe this one is one where he has a camera. No, this couldn't be one because it's a cameraless image. But I've seen one of his where he has a camera on a record player and he spins the record player, right? But the way he makes photographs is through pure experimentation. So with a lot of these, you can't predict what the image will look like. Uh, and this is one of mine from, um, I do a handmade photo workshop, uh, usually like a three-day workshop over a weekend around the country. And we do all sorts of techniques like uh, chemograms and you can barely predict what a chemogram is gonna look like. You can sort of, if you know the process, know what type, which paper is gonna go black and white in what areas, but you absolutely cannot pre-visualize and predict, which is really fun. Just checking time, okay, we're good. So again, a brief history. I just wanna really illustrate, and you've seen that in some of the last section, that, that abstract images, abstract photography has been around from the beginning, whether it was intentional to be abstract or not. So again, it was, it was we can, notice I say invention of photography announced. Photographs have been made before this, but Louis Daguerre announced it at the Academy, French Academy of Arts and Sciences officially, because that was basically the battle between the French and the English of who was going to claim photography that they had invented it. And Daguerre, he just, like, he just beat everyone else to it, basically. So that was 1839. Here's an image by William Henry Fox Talbot in 1835. And again, you might say, well, how can we call this abstract photographs? I mean, the reason it's abstract was due to the lack of knowledge, lack of chemistry or like materials, right? These, they didn't, it was such a new medium. They didn't even know what was going to happen half the time, but it's still an abstract image, right? It's still something that's distanced from reality. It's something that can create associations and we might not be able to identify the subject matter, right? With this one, you might not be able to identify the subject matter without the title. Here's another Fox Talbot, and of course he invented the calotype, C-A-L-O-T-Y-P-E, where Daguerre, his, he patented his as the daguerreotype. Um, and here's an image by Fox Talbot in 1839 that I would say is a beautiful abstract image. This is not, we might be able to identify that it's a tree, but it is not a, re, a realistic depiction of the way we would see a tree. So all through, all through photo history, scientific photography, I mean, photography has been used for science. Um, so when we looked at some of Draper's images uh, and a lot of the motion studies by Mar Mari and Moybridge, and then Rumkin invented the X-ray um, in 1895. And again, these were scientists using the camera for scientific studies, but the results are quite beautiful abstract images even though that might not have been their attention. I think the other reason I consider these abstract is not only because visually they feel abstract, but um, in a lot of these scientific images, they could not exactly pre-visualize or predict the outcome. You know, I mean, obviously the more adept Draper came at his moon daguerreotypes or Mari or Moybridge became at their motion studies, the more they could imagine, but they could never actually do what we do when we're trying to make an accurate photograph, which is 
I'm gonna look at that scene. I know my light, I know my shutter speed, I know my aperture. And if you're a good enough photographer, you can make that scene look, you know, via camera and processing like the scene that you saw before you. This is more of Mari's um, scientific images. This was photographing, I think, I believe it was like smoke um, movement. Um, here's another guy, he called it celestography. Um, he was, these are actually photograms, so there's no camera. They're cameraless images. He's playing with chemicals and paper, but he was playing with chemicals and paper outside underneath the stars. So he believed, which is why he called it celestography, he believed that the celestial skies were actually being depicted onto the paper, which we know now that wasn't happening, but um, they're very interesting. And what year was this? 1893. So I did like a, a whole semester class on abstract photography and each week we did a different topic and we did a week on the world unseen. And I call the world unseen all those, you know, think of spirit photography, right? All the otherworldly you know, think of it maybe as the surrealists of photography, right? The things that were not meant to be about reality. So I thought we could look at some examples of that. Uh, this guy, Louis Darget, was an early photographer in 1896, and he called these fluidic thought images. So he claimed if he would, he would run into the room, put the camera or the plate, I don't remember if he was just doing plates at that point, to his wife's head, and he swore that after he developed the plate that what was showing on the on the photograph was what his wife was thinking right so you know one of like one of them he's called like flying eagle he thought he if he did it while his wife was sleeping he could de depict what she was dreaming so he called them fluidic thought images uh uh Berdick was um he was sort of working in a similar manner but a little more in a scientific realm but you know he he thought that he was, and in a way, I guess he was because it was probably the heat from the hand that was actually altering the photographic plate. Um, but he believed he was depicting energetic fields that were radiating from the humans that he was. Of course, you've probably heard of spirit photography, right? Some of these people were just pure tricksters but others truly believed that when they saw some strange anomaly that happened on, on the glass plate, that it had to be some evidence of spirit or other otherworldly creatures that the camera was seeing, right? And when photography was first invented in the first few decades, many people believed that it was able to depict spirits or that, you know, it was that idea of looking into the soul, that it could steal the soul and then, of course, the great minor white, who you know, I consider one of the most spiritual photographers because um, he not only saw the medium as an expression of his own spiritualism, you know, a spiritual experience for himself, but also felt that photography could tap in again to this sort of otherworldly, the unseen world beyond the one we live in. And I just think. It's so fascinating what he was able to do with a camera and film and, and continuously tap into, you know, that otherworldly realm for him. He was a Zen Buddhist. And then there's this idea of straight photography, right? So think of Paul Strand um, as early as 1916 and Alvin Langdon Coburn. But Paul Strand, you know, I mean, Stieglitz in his last edition of camera work featured Paul Strand and he called it straight photography. So this was post pictorialism and the idea was this is the camera depicting a scene with no trickery. But I still love the trickery here or the creativity here for Strand was the camera angle and the perspective his composition. Right. So by just tilting the camera and I know today we might look at this and go, you know, whatever that's no big deal but then uh this was quite unique to take a camera and completely skew the angle 
to make it, um, you know, kind of topsy turvy, or to make it just about the light and shadow and not about the subject. And Paul Strand was so good at this. I think he was someone who really tapped into light and shadow. And I do think as photographers today, we often forget that our medium is light and shadow. And, you know, challenge yourself even to go out and just photograph light and shadow. I think we can forget about that. And Paul Strand was just, I think, one of the best when it came to that. So these are all Paul Strand. And then Alvin Langdon Coburn, who was an early pictorialist, developed this method where he would put several uh, glass prisms at the end of his lens, and he created what he called vortographs. And this was coming from a, a art movement at the time that was called vorticism. So he was kind of mimicking that, but it looks like a kaleidoscope, right? So he's using the straight camera, but he's just putting these glass prisms on the end to kind of totally obscure the way the camera is seeing the world. And then, you know, this very broad category that we would call modern art. But really, um, you know, in the 1920s and earlier is when uh, abstraction as a thing <laughs> in art and all art, painting, sculpture, started to become a thing. Like, I wouldn't call it a movement, but it became something that was recognizable, or I should say something that was, that people were going, oh, look, there's this thing called abstract art, and people are actually trying to make it, and that's what it is. And then of all the experimental art movements that were happening in Europe that were using photography, so in, in Russia at the time was called, the, they were the Russian constructivists. And some of them were Lisitsky and Bredchenko. And here, you know, as you can see, knowing photography, the, the way they're abstracting here is through pure perspective, right? There's no other methods or trickery or, you know, other strange alternative process, but they've abstracted the scene by just creating very interesting, odd perspectives. And if you like the Russian, if you like these, I would look at more of Rodchenko, especially Alexander Rodchenko, what he did with perspective and the camera is still to this day, I think, uh, amazing. And of course the Dada movement, right? Hannah Hoke who did these uh, photo collages. So the, the Dadaists took photos and began to, you know, kind of reappropriate them into this photo collage to, to become something else and represent something else. And if you look at a lot of Hannah Hope's work, she was the only female Dada. I mean, they used to send her off to get sandwiches and coffee as if she wasn't one of the artists, like she was the secretary, but she wasn't. She was a member of the Dada movement and the only female member. And so her work was very much about the perception and role of women in society then and within art. You know, women in beauty and women in being feminine and women having all these labels. And then right after the Dadaists came the Surrealists. You've probably all heard of the great man Ray, who was working with all sorts of techniques uh, in the dark room and with the camera. Um, and the surrealists were all about, you know, I like to call it like the trippy world, anything that was not everyday reality, whether that was the subconscious, dream world, fantasy, um, you know, the more you could take it there and the less it was based in reality, the better for them. So here is using solarization on the left and then multiple exposures on the right or camera movement, not sure. More of Las Lom Halinaji using the light painting and then on the right photograms. And Man Ray used photograms as well. So you know it's also called a cameraless image. Most of you probably know what a pho photogram is, but it's when you take a piece of photographic paper and you lay objects on it and you expose it to light and then process it. So no negative, no camera. And then even the California modernists, right, who were their whole manifesto for F64 was to depict reality accurately with the camera with the full depth of field and sharpness. Um, 
Ansel Adams, not so much, but Imogen Cunningham and Edward Weston, they even moved out into, um, you know, some abstract realms. So this is more Imogen and, and Edward Weston. And Aaron Siskin, a uh, phenomenal photographer of the 40s, 50s, and 60s. He's often thought of, um, he photographed Harlem in the early days, but he's often thought of as a street photographer, along with you know, Lee Friedlander and the other great Harry Callahan. Um, but, but Aaron Siskin worked heavily in abstract photographs. And he basically, he, he was very connected to the abstract expressionist painters of the New York School. And he hung out with them all the time in their studios. He was kind of one of them. And he challenged himself. He said, I'm going to try to do with the camera what you all have done with paint. And I think he succeeded. And he did that through black and white. And he would walk around the streets, mostly the streets of New York, but other places as well. And he would photograph, you know, like peeling, peeling, you know, movie bills and posters and uh, you know, walls crumbling, whatever he could find, right? And here's Otto Steiner from the German photo form movement, who, if you uh, want to check out um, abstract photography, Otto Steiner has gobs of it, all black and white, and just all the different ways he was able to use the camera to make abstract images was kind of mind boggling. Uh, so many different techniques from the one on the right, which is a straight photograph, almost still life, to the one on the left, which is just long exposure, pure, you know, movement. Okay, so where are we with time? Okay, good. So, you know, last but not least is some techniques for you to use to make some abstract photographs. Um, so I'm going to cover each of these, but Generally, we talk about abstract photograph being an exaggeration or simplification of an object. Uh, we've looked at a lot of examples of playing with perspective. We can use windows, reflections, and shadows, of course, soft focus or movement. And then I'm gonna wrap it up with some alternative process ideas, which you've seen some already from some of the examples. So exaggeration or simplification of a subject. So as some of you may know, um, one way to do that would be to use a telephoto lens or a macro lens, right? So you're simplifying the scene and maybe, you know, um, isolating, if not the subject, at least some element, whether it's a line, a shape, a texture, a color. Um, so simplifying that scene, often using simple compositions and thinking about maybe blank backgrounds. So again, the great Harry Callahan uh, was a master of this, right? Um, using very blank backgrounds and photographing, you know, maybe just a read of, of grass or one little element to create something that almost looks like a line drawing. So thinking about isolating your subject on a very simple background and, and create using the lines, the shapes, and the texture to create the composition. These are not all Harry Callahan. I'm just now showing you just examples of this technique. This is Uta Barth, a German photographer. Contemporary German photographer still shooting today. I call her the queen of minimalism. Or we can go to the other end of the spectrum, which would be exaggerating the subject. As you, many of you know, if you use a wide angle lens and then get very close, we can start to exaggerate elements of the scene and distort things. So these are two images of mine. Of Again, doesn't matter what it is, but you can see I'm shooting through glass, but getting very close to distort what we're looking at. The one on the right is actually looking down into a very small mason jar. So 
but again, the way wide angle, you know, can do that bowing and distorting of the scene or the subject can be really, can kind of throw us off, throw our senses off. I believe this is also Paul Strand. Of course, Edward Weston and his Pepper series, this is exactly what he was doing, right? Taking an object uh, and distorting it by getting close with a wide lens. And then we talked in the beginning of the lecture of um, when the subject is missing or the object, what's left is the associations. And one of the alluring things about this Pepper series is we, many people often say they think of the human form, right, or, or physical body when they look at this, because you don't look at it immediately and think, oh, green pepper or red pepper, and it being in black and white helps, of course. But I think we immediately make an association to some sort of human form, physical form, uh, we looked at like Rodchenko and the Russian constructivists. You know, think about another way you can make an abstract image is just by taking really unique perspectives, right? Just something out of the ordinary, getting high up, getting down low, getting close. So I'm like, I'm like right under the flower with the light shining through it. So thinking about how perspective can confuse, not only distort the scene, but maybe confuse the viewer a little bit. This is a photographer, he just passed away in the last few years. I forget his name, he's out of Hong Kong, but he goes to major cities and photographs these, you know, cities and all the buildings and the chaos. And I love the way he almost creates these abstract paintings out of them. The other fun thing with abstract photography is you can see from looking at these examples, it's like any subject can be interesting, right? It doesn't have to be something special. You don't have to wait for that beautiful light and that beautiful landscape or that person, or it can be anything. So windows, reflections, and shadows can be fun ways to begin to play with abstract imagery. Maybe one of the more accessible ways, uh, if you, maybe it's a good place to start, is thinking about windows, reflections, or shadows. Maybe using some long exposures. So this is a colleague of mine, but I love that, you know, this is a photograph. I mean, we think tree, but she's not actually shooting the tree. This almost looks like a Lee Friedlander, but I'm not, I think this is a Lee Friedlander who almost always did his own reflections. You know, even something as simple as this that is a bit of a straight photograph, but by using this heavy shadow to obscure half of most of her face, suddenly throws it into this whole other realm.
Another great way to play um, with the camera would be soft focus or movement. And we've seen a lot of examples of movement. Um, but soft focus is another great way. I think that the key with soft focus is you gotta, I always say like, if you're gonna do it, do it all the way. If it's just slightly out of focus, it looks like an accident. Like, oops, I forgot to focus. But if you really wanna play with soft focus, like make it very intentional. I like soft focus when it's so soft that it just feels like your eyes are glazing over, but there's still a hint of subject. So like this is, I wanted that feeling when you first open your eyes on a warm, sunny morning and you're still waking up, but the sun's, you know, blasting through the window. And then this is Uta Barth. And I love how there's still a sense that this is like a potentially a street, a city street, a wall, a building, a tree. So there's these little hints of, of what might be there. Uh, this is Francesca Woodman. She's no longer with us, um, who did a lot of these long exposure uh, movement self-portraits. It's minor white. This is Otto Steinart from the photo forum that I was talking about. He used so many different techniques for his abstract imagery. So long exposure. This is also Otto Steinart. Harry Callahan. So that movement can be shaking the camera. It can be the subject moving. Maybe it's movement and soft focus. And again, degrees of abstraction. It's slightly identifiable, well, it is identifiable, but it's not the way we would see it with our own eyes. And then last but not least, uh, you know, Alternative process, or um, well, I don't know what else to call it besides alternative process, is a really fun way to play with abstract imagery, right? So these, this is a project I did in graduate school. These were like three by five feet prints, and they started with an X-ray, and I, they got blown up in the enlarger, and then I scanned them at Kinko's and made them big, and you know, then I waxed them and burned them and all that stuff. But you know, I just kept doing things to take them further and further away. And when they were finally hanging on the wall, I didn't care. I didn't want people to be like, oh, that's an x-ray from your body. And no, I just wanted them to see it and just have the association of where it could take them. But every step I made was to take it further and further away from what it originally was. This is a fantastic photographer working today, Allison Rossiter, who works with all like expired photographic paper. Um, so no camera, she just uses old photographic paper and chemicals and light and does, and probably some other chemicals and materials and just makes these beautiful abstract images. This is Alan Rossiter to Allison Rossiter too. Marco Brewer, I showed you some of his images before. He again uses cameraless images. He burns scratches, scrapes, dents. You know, he just takes the photographic paper and manipulates it in a bunch of different ways and then, and then processes it. So it's almost like, I love, I love this idea of it's, it's as pure as painting. And not that photography isn't pure, but you know, a painter is putting paint on canvas and this is using photography's purest elements. I mean, there's not even a camera. It's using paper and light and chemicals, you know, as it all started and, and creating beautiful images just from that. Photograms, another great way if you have access to photographic paper. You can find used photographic paper online I mean, I walked into a like reclamation, home, home reclamation place here in Missoula a few years ago and found 
10 boxes of 16 by 20 and 20 by 24 old paper. No one there knew what it was. They gave it to me all for $5. <laughs> it was, some of it was water destroyed. It was a mess, but it's really fun for stuff like this. So if you can get your hands on that kind of stuff, um, send it to me, you know, go ahead and, and have fun with it, right? Do you need the chemicals, of course, fixer and developer, but you don't need a lot of space. You don't need a dark room. Um, chemograms you actually do out in the light. This is a guy you can see applying syrup on glass. So dye transfer prints, so a color process. You know, I'm really just showing you all the different ways that you can just play and experiment. Frederick Sommer from the 60s, Look at these beautiful images. I'll show you his process of what he's doing. But he's basically, he has these big pieces of paper and he's just cutting shapes into them and then lighting them and photographing them in this really beautiful way. So I love this technique of play, but then his understanding of light and photography to make the image look uh, the way he wants it to. I know we're almost out of time. I have maybe, Seven, a couple more slides and that's it. So these are some of the techniques that we use in my handmade photo class, the chemograms, lumens. Lumens is using old photographic paper and plant material and they heat up in the sun and they all the plant material starts to ooze and sweat. And so not only is the photo paper getting exposed by the sun, but the, you know, all the, the chemicals and, and, you know, organic material coming out of the plant life begins to change the way the paper reacts. This is a, an example of what making lumens looks like. The hotter, the hotter it is, um, the sunnier and the more the stuff can sweat, the, the cooler the results are. And then chemograms is just using photographic paper, developer and, and um, fixer and water. And it's out in the light. And you just basically, you can put any, any material on, on the paper. I mean, toothpaste or hairspray or glue or any anything that liquid thing that will stick to it. And it depends on what kind of old paper you use and how old it is and how destroyed it is and all those things. And then cyanotypes, you know, sometimes I think people think of cyanotypes as like exact, you know, they're contact prints. So people think of them as very exact uh, prints of a negative, but you can also have fun with photograms and movement, like the one on the right. The one on the left is just layered plant life, but the one on the right is those little origami butterflies that you saw in my other photograph, and I have them just laying on the paper, so they're creating this like ghost-like image. There's just so much you can do. So just to finish up, this is a great, I love, this is a phenomenal book. It's not about photography, but it's about the abstract expressionist movement in New York City. And this is a woman who wrote a book focusing on the women of abstract expressionists who didn't get enough attention. They were always the wives of the men or the friends and lovers of the men. But these women were integral and it's so important to the movement. It's called Ninth Street Women, Five Painters and the Movement that Changed Modern Art. It's a phenomenal book if you're interested in history at all. But I love this quote. She says, the result was abstraction, free of anything but the material which with the art was made and the naked energy of the artist who produced it. So my assignment for all of you in a creative Simon is to make an abstract image using one of the techniques we discussed. And I know you guys are recording this, but um, Betsy, I'd be happy to like screenshot the slide and send it to you if you need a reminder of the techniques we discussed. Um, but maybe challenge yourself to head out in the next few weeks and um, you know, you don't need to go anywhere special. You could do it anywhere in your backyard, in your house um, and think about using these techniques to create a unique photograph. Thanks everyone. Um, I don't know if there's any questions or if we have time for questions, but I'm always open. I would say if people want to reach out and you know get in, in touch with me via email, that's great.
Yeah, well, thank you so much, Eileen. I uh, really appreciate it. I love seeing all those examples and some ideas to take on for the rest of the summer too. So um, we do have the ability for people to unmute themselves and ask questions. So feel free to just unmute your microphone and ask a question if you have one. Might be hard to ask questions about abstract photography. <laughs> like, just go do it. Just go try anything. So Marianne said, very inspiring. Yeah. I had a question, um, Eileen, when you're thinking about shooting abstractly, do you go out with like the mission to do that? Do you have an idea, an intent in mind of what you're trying to create? Do you just play and what comes out of it? you see if anything strikes your, you know, fancy yeah. in terms of liking it? I'd say it's been all of the above. I've certainly approached it all different ways. I've definitely tried to like set something up because I had an idea in my mind and I wanted it to be abstract. Um, you know, maybe it's like tabletop or I, or I specifically, you know, like I said, set it up. Uh, but I've also, or maybe I've just gone out to play and make abstract images. And then I've also, been out there maybe doing my serious photography. I don't want to say, I don't mean that, but like with an intention of shooting something else and then an abstract Im image happened in the interim, right? So it's also kind of being just open to the possibilities of um, what might happen. So I think, I think I've approached it certainly all different ways. Okay, thanks. And there's, you know, I, when I, I would talk about in my lectures a lot, I think of the spectrum of the ways that we can photograph and on one end is what you're talking about of just like pure play willy nilly whatever happens and on the other end is having this very. Uh, you know clear idea and intention of what you want and trying to get it and I always tell people to figure out where you are on each end of the spectrum. Where you tend to be and then force yourself to go to the other one, so if you are that photographer who's always just responding and playing and I don't know whatever then it might be good for you to have an intentional project or intentional shoot where you are trying to, you have an idea ahead of time. And the idea might even be, I'm just shooting shapes. It doesn't have to be a deep idea. But if you're that photographer that always is going out with the intention of doing something, then it's probably time to, to just play and not have an intention. It's all, it's all about that exercise in the creative brain, right? We know there's so much research on creativity and we know that a creative brain, the reason the creative brain is different than a non-creative brain is it's just that more parts of the brain light up more often. And a brain that's not creative, not as many, there's a lot of darker parts that aren't being lit up. So it's like cross-training, you know? So I think it's good to know the way you work and then try to force yourself to, to work in a different way. Really interesting, thanks. Anyone else have any questions? All right, then I guess we'll say good night. Is there any other housekeeping we need to know, Anne? Um, no, I don't think so. I'm sorry I, I didn't get the recording started in time, but we'll, we got most of it. All right, well, thank you again so much, Eileen, for joining us all the way from out in Montana. We really appreciate it. Thanks everyone who could make it tonight and we look forward to seeing you at a future CVPS event. Uh, in the near sure. future. Have a great night, everybody. Uh, thanks. See ya.